Hello, hello everyone. Welcome back to Venture Wisdom. And this is the place where we talk everything venture capital and private equity. Uh, today we are here to talk about the compliance and regulatory environment in venture capital and private equity. We have a very interesting gentleman who's joining us today to, to share his thoughts, his learnings, his experiences. Brian Riley and uh, Brian has been into the compliance financial asset management industry for about 25 years now. Uh, he currently is the uh, regional director for the Middle East at Apex Compliance Solutions. Um, as I said, he has been doing this for 25 years, so I'm sure we are going to hear a lot of very interesting points from him. Right, so thank you again for taking time for us. I was just uh, talking to somebody who is a compliance officer some uh, at some place else. And uh, the gentleman said that, Rakesh, I feel more like a detective. Uh, and I asked why. He said, I'm always trying to solve mysteries of what all is actually allowed. Uh, happy to hear your perspectives, what your thoughts are, uh, perhaps starting with your journey a little bit. Yeah, so I listen, I'm just, when you were speaking to your friend, I think he's, he's, he's quite right in the, in the sense that there's a lot of gray areas. That The rule books and the regulations are, are drafted and they can't always foresee every situation. Right. And often, and the intention that you have to read between the line on, on what the regulator or the law draftsman was was intending when they were were drafting that regulation, and I think regulators capture that by the spirit of regulation, you know, the spirit of the rules that you comply with, rather than trying to circumvent around rules um, in, in that respect. So it's important, but definitely you are a detective as a compliance officer, <laughs> you, know, you and, and basically you can never take anything on face value. Um, because someone will come with a, a regulatory issue and they'll have a certain experience and mindset of what the issue is, but you really need to speak to everyone who's involved in the issue and, and really get to understand it before you give advice. It's very, very easy for a compliance officer to give incorrect advice if they don't know the story and, and, and of where the actual problem is. So often I say to compliance officers, you need to really frame the problem. You know, when, when somebody comes with them and, and make sure that you understand every aspect of it before you answer. Because yeah. um, if a compliance officer does it incorrectly or gives you incorrect advice, the trust is gone. Um, and, and, and I always say that, that the compliance officers need to be careful um, and consider everything they put in writing and everything they say to make sure it's always 100% correct. But how much so, of it is interpretation and how much of it is actually written in the books that are that are defining the regulations uh, in the world so I, I think i think a lot of it's open to to interpretation basically as i say it's uh, the rule books are getting bigger and bigger and um, so the the regulators and the and the governments they they do want to they do want to regulate for every situation but it's a fast moving world we live in and, and things change and especially with modern financial techniques and technology you know blockchain etc etc you know the, the rules were never drafted mm. to consider blockchains or cryptocurrency mm. so you know it's you constantly have to adapt you constantly have to interpret you constantly have to be looking at consultation papers that regulators are issuing just not on a local scale but on a on a on, on a global scale as well you really want to know what the global regulatory bodies and advisory bodies are doing and that's really important. So one of the things that being a compliance officer is not boring. You know, you, 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 it changes every day. And, and, um, you really do need to keep on top of it. So you never think, know it, no, 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 it's exactly. exactly. <laughs> so uh, um, while, while uh, you have spent most of your life in banking and asset management uh, and the compliances around that, uh, and we will be discussing that. I'm still curious, while you spoke about the changing environment in the compliance and regulatory environment because of technology, uh, because of more globalization, cross-border transactions, uh, multiple jurisdictions, and whatever the reason would be. The point that you brought in uh, about the regulators working over, uh, over time for, for to, to keep up with the changes. I'm curious, before we get into the actual subject, what do you think, are the regulators actually involving the people from industry to get that piece of reg new regulations in place? Or is it a set of bureaucrats or uh, whatever who are working on it? Yeah, <laughs> 
Listen, I used to be a regulator, so um, and, you know, um, I, I you know, I, I will say, listen, I think I think regulators um, they do need to consult with with industry. They do need to understand the problem. They do need the experience. Um, and and I was an industry professional before I became a regulator, so I had a certain um, information that, that wouldn't be always open to to every regulator that, that's out there some people are career regulators they you know they go to the regulator at a very young age from university and they're, they're regulated for the rest of their career and they build up a very good knowledge and, and you know i was always amazed when when i was with the regulator about the knowledge and the experience and the professionalism of some of the people who work at the regulator but you know things move very fast, um, and and regulators need to to monitor that, um, and they need to um, understand the different risks that are evolving out of all the things that you said. You know, cross borders, financial technology, you know, all these different new things. Regulators need to keep on on top of that, and I think on the whole they do a good job. They try their best, basically, um, but it's. It's incumbent on industry as well to educate regulators as well um, in, in a sense of, you know, there's consultation papers out there. Industry participants should always be involved in themselves, getting to know the regulator, notifying them when there's issues on, on regulations from their side. Um, I think everyone's well intended. I think regulators are well intended. They really want to protect the economy, society, investors, you know, it's it's a public service job really um you know yes. people would you know and, and, and many many dedicated individuals i've met regulators that, that, that really want to do the best but it's it's we're human beings and it's not always easy to yeah. um to, to you know communicate and to get the problems across and, and you know, to, to leave things behind but i think i think we're evolving all the time when it comes to regulation and regulators listening, it's less prescriptive now than I think it was. And, and I think they understand that industry needs to be consulted and needs to be informed. And, and, and there, the risk from a regulator's perspective is, is called regulatory capture. Whereas mm -hmm. if the regulator becomes too close to industry and makes the regulations too favorable for industry participants, and they forget about who they're really trying to, you know, the regulations are there to protect investors. Um, yep. especially retail investors. So regulators have to be mindful that, you know, industry can't influence it too much. It's still an independent entity that really needs right. to have a balanced approach. So getting that balance can sometimes be difficult. Yeah. So um, uh, now that you have you have worked across uh, the, uh, the regions between MENA and Europe, um, and uh, I'm pretty sure you would have seen the landscape uh, for the venture capital and private equity evolving. The regulatory landscape is what I mean, sure. right? And uh, uh, what to what extent do you feel it has the, the regulatory environment has matured, uh, and how much work is still there? I I I, I buy it. You, you said that it's it evolves every day and it will never stop. It's a never ending process. But compared to what it was, perhaps. A decade ago, this industry is is new, right? Though it has been uh, the the venture capital as a as a term and action has been existing for 30, 40 years, but as yeah. an industry, perhaps last a decade and a half, two decades at the most. Uh, where do you see the regulatory environment today uh, across the uh, jurisdictions? So yeah, I think listen, it's definitely heading in the right direction. So so ten years ago, you know, venture capital was a not a well-known word and, and what venture capitalists were doing and, and trying to do that um really wasn't in the regulations basically but what you've seen is a shift especially in the MENA region um especially with the likes of the dfsa and the fsra and in, in, in adgm being more risk-based being more proportionate to the risks because they they realize that the venture capital space is solely for professional investors you know, they, mm -hmm. they, they know it's, you know, when people set up a venture capitalist fund manager or a fund, they're not really trying to target retail investors. You know, that I would, you know, claim that my, my aunt Agatha, who lives in Bournemouth, who is a retired teacher, you know, we really shouldn't be putting her money into, into venture capital fund because, you know, it's just not suitable from a risk based perspective. So the regulators have acknowledged, um, and I think that's including the UK and the SEC as well, that, that you know, this is, is a market that really is only open to professional investors. 
with mm-hmm. considerable experience and financial uh, soundness behind them that they can bear the risks if a venture capital fund goes wrong. Um, yeah. And I think, you know, and that's good that that balance is there because venture capital funds are good, right? Because we're, we're talking about startups and growth and any economy needs needs sensible regulation when it comes to that. Because basically if you over-prescribe or have too many rules in the relation to venture capital, then they're never going to take off. You know, and, yeah, and it, it gets counterproductive because... Uh, exactly. By by very nature, venture capital and private equity is a high risk asset class, right? But it is an important asset class. Nobody yeah. can ignore it today as we as we speak. Um, uh, Over regulation can be painful as well. Absolutely, and I think that re- the regulators get that. I think uh, you, you're seeing some shift. I think maybe in the SEC at the moment, you know that that, that they're trying to perhaps put too much regulation on, in that field. But I think everyone gets it. Every you know, everyone gets it that, that actually venture capital is the good things. If these companies are successful, they employ more people, there's more tax revenue for governments, there's more yeah. a booming economy, et cetera, et cetera. So personally I think I think they're the most important um, part of, uh, of of any sort of economic society basically is is giving these people the right finance to build enterprises and make success of them. And then everyone okay. benefits. So, so I totally, I'm a, I'm a massive fan of, of private equity and, and venture capital, and I think the market's really evolved in the last ten years um, to allow this to happen without overly prescriptive regulations. Awesome. So now, now if we if we look at the business of a venture capital capitalist and a private equity. Uh, GP, CFO, compliance officer, and so on. And if we yeah. just kind of split their life between, well, they're, they're generally the, 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 the closed ended funds, right? And if we, if we split the life between the starting to the operating life of that five, seven, 10 years uh, and the winding down, which part of that three, three part life do you think is, is most heavy on the regulations? Well, I think, I think. I think it all is actually in, 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 in different, it's all important. Each one of those segments, each one of those stages is, is really important. And, and, and I think you made a few good examples and looking at regulations in the MENA region, where, which I operate in now, you know, a venture capital fund has to have it, you know, um, sort of like a, a be closed ended. You know, it, there's, again, it has to invest, you know, 90%, so one regulator says 90% has to be in unlisted companies that are no longer than 10 years old. So, mm-hmm. again, you're, you're, you're seeing that, basically. So, But the first the first stage, really, is for any venture capitalist manager is to set up a venture capitalist fund manager in a regulated jurisdiction. Um, if they want to be successful and they and they want to apply to a, apply to a broad market, Becoming regulated gives you, I won't call it a stamp of approval, but it, it, it allows your investors to have a level of comfort that you've totally. that owned and you're controlled and that you have appropriate co- corporate governance in place. So for me, if I was a venture capitalist fund manager who wanted to set up a fund, I'd set up a, a fund manager in, in a recognized jurisdiction uh, where it's regulated. I comply with the rules for the, the fund launch. Obviously, when you go into a regulated jurisdiction, that, that first stage is going to be quite difficult because you've got to apply for a regulatory license. And, and basically, um, so for example, you know, you're, you're going and they'll, they'll want you to, um, who's going to set the business up? Who owns the business? What's the business strategy? And they often call it a regular business plan. So the venture capital manager must have a clear idea and strategy of how his business is going to operate in the future, how he's going to staff it, where it's going to be based, who it's going to be regulated by. And obviously that's always the stage where, you know, you're, you're engaging with regulators and, mm-hmm. and the basic regulators are scrutinizing your application to ensure, that, you know, one that, you know, you've got the competency and the proficiency to, to run a, a venture capital fund. Um, and that often that's track record. They're looking at your track record if you've been a, an investor in a venture capital fund or if you've had you've worked in a bank or a financial institution where you've run venture capital funds, that that really helps. So they're looking at your pedigree. 
to make sure that uh, you, you you will be a success. So if, I, if I may pick on that particular point, Brian, yeah. if you allow me to interrupt. Uh, yeah. Now the track record piece is very important when it comes to the fundraise for the for the fund managers or the partners, right? But then uh, you, you, what you are saying it it makes the life easy when you are going for the regulatory uh, uh, licenses as well. Uh, it, and how how much does it change when I do not have a track record at all? I'm a first time manager. So so, so basically the, the the regulators and I'm, I'm talking really about where the reasons I've operated in, they, they have a fit and proper test. So so basically when they're looking at any individual that's starting up, they're, they're making sure that, that person is, is one, is, is fit, you know, in the sense that they're not criminal, they haven't got a criminal past, that, you know, they're, they're bona fide um, individuals um, who are financially sound and, and have not made past mistakes in, you know, their financial arrangements of their own personal or looking after other people money. But they're also looking at competence and capability. And obviously, if you've got a track record of being established, um, and then it's easier as an application process mm -hmm. because you've proven it. it is more difficult if you haven't got a track record and, and you know, and somebody just walks off the street and wants to be a venture capital manager. You know, you, you, it is very, very difficult. You know, you, you need the training, you need the competency and the capability to be able to launch that so regulators so how, do we, gonna... how do we define the track record is it that i have been a manager myself i have raised the funds earlier or i have worked with some other funds not necessarily and i, th I think that's that's up to the applicant who, who goes into the regulator to basically persuade them in in the sense of saying look on one scale, there's the, the really experienced applicant, but then on the other scale, there's, there's a person who has worked in or around this field and who knows mm -hmm. what they're talking about. Um, and obviously, you know, they, sometimes it's a thing about age and it's about experience, but it's, it's really about, you know, how, you know, confident that person is, you know, and, 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 and yeah. so regulators don't really set any clear criteria around but basically they they want to you know make sure that they get the best you know they're the so, best people. so they're like the visa officers you don't know why you're getting the visa or you're not getting the visa <laughs> yeah <laughs> and i think i think, I think and listen i think you know that in, in a sense of sometimes it's yes or no but but sometimes if you lack experience as a venture capitalist manager you might want to put um a ned a non-executive director on your board if you if you set mm -hmm. up a fund who has got experience, who can oversee yeah. and hang, can give you that. So there's always solutions to everything. That's that's a great point. And that's what actually I was coming to. So if, if at all there are certain things which as a manager, probably uh, a first-time manager for that matter, and you brought that great point in, let's consider the, the region and the regulators that you are working with today. Uh, what are those few things, top five things that I should keep in mind when I'm going for my regulatory approvals and the licenses? So I think, I think for, for me, it's, it's the, the top things that I would do is, is one, um, you know, have a very good CV, you know, the, the, of the person. So the person who's making that application is, has really thought about their experience and can And it can be a group of people as well? It can be a group of people. Usually it is, you know, usually there'll be, mm. you know, it'll be um, two or three individuals who, both, all, all three of them would have different experience levels. You, might, you know, I, I've seen ones where, you know, one was a venture capitalist, one had worked in a bank, one had, you know, been in insurance or whatever. And, and it's basically making sure that there's those skills around the table to make this venture a success. So I think, you know, making sure that the CVs and the right people are there. And then obviously you're going to, um, you know, the right competency. And again, we've mentioned about, you know, bringing in a, a NED or anyone like that as well to oversee it, or to, even as an executive director, you know, someone who's got a bit of grey hair like myself um, and experience in, in these who can guide people who are less experienced. So mm -hmm. they'll, look at, they'll look at the body of the company and, and who's there rather than one you know, sole individual if you have less experience. If, as a, sure. you know, if, if there's one or two of you, you know, you don't need to be in, uh, set up in Dubai or... Abu Dhabi, you know, in, in these special economic zones, you only need an SEO really and a compliance officer and a money laundering reporting officer. But then if you've got less experience, you probably want a broader range of people around you. And, and venture capitalists usually, in my experience, have four or five people around that, that are very specialist in their area. 
So yeah. if you if you you know and and you know who are perhaps industry specialists, so they may have no financial services experience, but perhaps they worked in the industry that the venture capital is looking to invest in, and that's a great asset for any board or management um, team to have. Basically. So if I'm hearing it right, along with the CV, you have a well-defined thesis, and to 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 support your investment. Yeah. capabilities into that thesis you have the people on board exactly and it, it's brilliant i think the way of calling the thesis is a, is a very good idea i think anyone who wants to set up a, a venture capital fund and be a venture capitalist fund manager has to write a business plan you know mm -hmm. that, that basically is a thesis that says look this is what my strategy is this is the people behind it this mm -hmm. is how i'm gonna, this is what i'm going to look to invest in and and you know it, it it needs to show the correct parameters of investment. You know, it's purely going to be venture capital. Here's my risk management. Here's how, here's how you know, every, you know, we were talking about the five important things. CV and people is definitely there. Risk management is another thing. You know, mm -hmm. what is risk in this business model? So anyone who puts their thesis together and anyone who's, who's you know, gone to university and written a thesis, you know, you have to critique the thesis right you need to show different angles of the thesis and different arguments etc and really it is that you know it's look where are the risks in this business model and mm. obviously regulators get comfort when they see that someone's understood the risks and, and then worked on a way to mitigate or manage those risks um so again you have that that thesis that business plan that really shows you know what you're doing um and I would say after people, that's really critical. And then you, you've got things like that, you know, you want appropriate finance, basically. So there's very light capital adequacy requirements on venture capital fund managers in, in the region that I'm working at the moment. But you still need to be able to pay, pay your bills as they fall due. You, you know, you still of course. Really operate the company as a going concern. And there's things like, you know, professional indemnity insurance, director's insurance, you know, all those things that would be sensible um for a firm to have so do those insurances have to be part of the plan or do they have to have them in place when they are going for the license no not when so when they when they when you go for the li license you don't have to have anything in place i mean in the sense of it you need the plan it's just the plan. You, okay yeah so you give the plan and then the, the, basically the the regulators will grant you a license but they'll say look you need to get a full-time seo senior executive officer in place in the jurisdiction that you're operating in, you need office space, you know, and then and, and they'll come down. But venture capital is a game because they take this risk based and approach and a, a proportionate approach, um, you know, would have less requirements as, say, somebody who's setting up as a general asset manager. Um, right. And venture capitalist, you know, if you're an asset manager of, say, a more vanilla equities or bonds or whatever you, you know you, you may need an independent auditor you know may need an independent custodian venture capitalists don't need that because again mm. you don't really you know you're investing and you're getting an equity share usually in a, a startup company or a company that's recently been established so you don't really need an independent custodian you're not going to give detailed valuations of the company and again all your investors understand that and they understand the risk of course, yeah. So, um, no. uh, in your experience, um, uh, the, 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 does the success rate changes for an approval when the managers, or if at all, the managers go directly for the approvals, or do they generally have the specialist agencies who help them do that, or if, if is there a split, is there a balance, or one or the other way? So, yeah. So usually, I mean, I think if you're looking at the MENA region, you know, so who I work for, Apex Compliance Consultancy, um, and there's many other companies around as well who do the same as us. Basically, they will assist you in, with your application. Um, mm -hmm. Usually, the regulator likes you to see to come through via, you know, a consultancy or a law firm who understands the process, etc. And, and then can advise you on the best way to go out around licensing. You know, it's very unusual for someone to go directly to the regulator uh, and apply. You can, yeah. but, but, you know, um, you're not going to... Technically, you can. Practically, it makes more sense to have the right guidance in place. That's what you're saying. Uh, of course, yeah. Because, you know, when, when you go to the regulator, um, and this is always my advice and experience, is you want to go with a detailed plan and strategy and the right documents, et cetera, et cetera your whole process 
an application will go a lot more smoothly if you if you if you treat it without regard and and you think you can just push your way through the process it, it doesn't work and, yeah. and reg regulators will get nervous because they're looking for a level of professionalism right every sure. every regulator is looking for a professional application but uh, tell me one thing uh, here brian uh, uh, how many times does this happen that it is just the when i say it i mean the application it is just sent back for the review and come back and how many times does it get rejected and if it does get rejected do they or do they do they entertain a reapplication and yeah. how hard is it when you already were rejected with the new application okay so i think I and mean, it's a really good question actually so so an application will will go through in, in generally if, in any area that i've worked will go through certain stages so there's always the pre-application process mm -hmm. so you engage with your regulator you tell them the plan and they mm -hmm. allow you then to put a regulatory application in place so you know for me is is get to the regulator early speak with them interact with them um and then basically say look this is our plan this is what we're going to do and, and they'll give you the nod of approval um and, and say okay yeah put a formal application in but you, you know they want that to happen quite quickly and then what will happen is 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 it will perhaps it will go for a first review stage you know so somebody will look at the regulatory business plan a, a case officer will be assigned and they'll come back with comments and changes um you know or things that they they're not 100 percent clear or comfortable with and they want more clarity on and then basically the regulator um then processes it again it can still be rejected at any time because the regulator will do searches on the individuals that are behind the applicant you know so they won't just take anyone off the street you know they'll they'll want to they'll check them on, on certain search engines to make sure that they're they're legitimate individuals without any sort of uh, past that, that could be a criminal or anything like that so you know so and that process goes if you put a good application in the process should be quite smooth and that's why i always say to applicants always put a good application in that's considered everything and and then the process gets moved when it starts bouncing back and forth that's when you get delays and things don't happen smoothly so, but do you have any specific example that you can quote where the point of rejection was probably a very small ignorance or mistake it was nothing large because generally what i have seen in these kind of cases the big problems are addressed people know what the big problems could be there can be some yeah. smaller things that sometimes can think, get ignored yeah so i mean listen i think i think it depends on what regulator and what jurisdiction you're doing if you're in, if you're in the uk you'll just get a rejection if they don't like it and, and they may give you a comment and they may not they'll just say you know go and do better um hmm. if you're if you're working in in the MENA region, um, I think regulators are more open to, to engaging with you and saying, look, um, you know, you, you've suggested a fund. It doesn't meet the criteria that's set down for a venture capital fund. Remember, I was speaking earlier that, say, 90% of the investments have to be in venture capitalist startups, you know. You know, some people put an application in, they don't. They don't say that they want to do something else basically and, and mm. again it's a bit confusing for a regulator if it doesn't match the regulatory requirements so every application you want to put in you should review the regulatory requirements with your consultant if you go via a consultant and say yes sure. we match those and this is how we're doing it and then what happens with all consultancy and law firms we have a template regulatory business plan that we share with our clients and help to populate so it covers the essential elements um and that, that's the benefit of really employing someone to assist you with the application. Sure. So mo moving on from the the initial stage where you are applying and assume that all went well, but generally would because they have some smart uh, lawyers and consultants helping them. Uh, and I started the fund, right? What What are the key compliances which generally are applicable throughout that life of five, seven, 10 or 12 years and sometimes beyond that as well because i believe uh, most regulators have a requirement of keeping your records available even beyond the sunset when you have it yeah, uh, no, you, absolutely, you have gone, yeah. Gone down. yeah so, good question yeah so i think listen so let's talk about the first one right it, it, anti-money laundering mm -hmm. 
back in the financing of terrorism and, and sanctions and all that, all that legislation and regulations that people have to comply with. Um, anyone who's accepting money from, from an investor has to identify and verify the identity of that investor. Um, mm -hmm. And they keep records, you know, for a certain period of time, like six years after the business relationship ends. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just just not a one-off exercise when you come to identifying people. You know, you, you need to take a risk-based approach. So you need to, you know, the venture capital manager needs to understand if it's a high-risk client, a medium-risk client, or a low-risk client. And then, and who defines that? So basically, usually the the, the handbook or the, the regulator's rules will, will tell you what a high-risk client is. So if a high-risk sure. client is in a, in a high-risk jurisdiction or has their source of wealth from a high-risk activity, um, if they've got a nexus with high-risk jurisdictions, then again, that's always defined. But what happened with the venture capitalist will have to decide on its customer risk assessment. And basically, that and how, how often do they have to do this risk assessment over that life? So every 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 time a client on boards, they have to. Every time an investor on boards, they'll have to do an assessment. But the, the, the life of my fund is longer, right? So say it is ten years, just for the argument's sake. Yeah. But I onboarded in the first year. Do I have yeah. to do it repeatedly over those ten years again and again, or I'm good for the so, first time? No, no. So you have to do it repeatedly. Um, and and I don't think regulators like saying it repeatedly you have to do it on a risk-based approach so if if you have a high risk investor you should look at that relationship every year you okay. should go make sure your documents are up to date and correct and, and 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 also you want to be looking at you know the uh, the behaviors of that investor as well um you know you know if they promised you 10 million and you know that's what you're expecting but they've given you 20 million or less or you know you, you want to understand why um this investor is giving you and obviously that's usually for legitimate purposes you know they just want to increase their exposure but you know from a transaction perspective you have to you know one of the things is monitoring the behaviors of your customers is a very important aml requirement on vc managers on, on in fact every asset usually invest venture capital funds have a limited amount of investors we're not talking you know hundreds or thousands of investors right. here usually you're getting five or ten and it's not a particularly onerous task um to do that with you sure um and, and then and, uh, yeah go ahead sorry please. so just and then obviously once you've got your kyc requirements you've got to have a money laundering reporting officer who needs to assure that the systems and controls are operating effectively around anti-money laundering um, and and you need to you know do checks to make sure that you know, people aren't on sanctions lists and, and there's no negative news out there. So that is a big responsibility, but as I say, it's more limited because you're not expecting a, a huge amount of investors in a venture capital fund. But it's a very very, especially in the in the UAE, it's a very important responsibility that, that everyone has to comply with. Of course. And how about the other side where I have some mandatory uh, filings to the regulator itself? Are there any yes. such things? So, yeah. So the regulator, and, and as I say, what happens is for a venture capital fund manager, they usually don't want to go and employ a full-time compliance officer and a money laundering reporting officer. So they usually outsource to, to someone like Apex Compliance Solution or other consultants, basically. And they mm -hmm. will, for a fee every month, for to be your compliance officer and them on a row. And then they'll give you a regulatory calendar of mm. when things to be submitted to the regulators. So whether it be, you know, change of control, you know, somebody else comes in, especially into the company you're wondering. And then they'll guide you through that process. The regulators want you to take a, they don't want to stop business. They want you to take a risk-based approach and make a, a, a judgment and an assessment of the risk because not everyone is high risk because they're you know they've got a connection with a high risk country you know it's very rare that, you know it's it's people have to take a make an assessment and be a judgment and be able to say yeah no I, this person is on high risk you know so uh, rules can be very discriminatory um and and you know to to individuals and to different uh, activities and it's important for the compliance officer to make sure that you're taking a balanced and proportionate approach um when doing business sure so moving moving on in the life uh, life of the manager uh, or the gp uh, if we get 
to the, the the fag end of it right where we have done good investments we made good money we we distributed good money back to the investors now it's time to wind down uh does it get easier difficult because if you see in in a normal business i'm not talking about the fund management asset management we see a private equity but if you see in in most jurisdictions across the world the harder hardest part is to actually wind down your business right uh, how about so this, this scenario in the venture capital and private equity yeah it is for me for me it's as important as opening a business um it's it's it really is the you know as you said the fag end but it, it's it's more important i think than sometimes because basically you know you come to the end of the life cycle um yeah. and one the first thing you want to do basically is and hopefully the fund's been a, a huge success but you want to distribute the the assets basically or the benefits of the assets the the money that the fund has meant to the investors and and it mm-hmm. needs to be done there and obviously venture capital manager needs to ensure his fees are paid as well um because you know he's obviously made a massive success of, of, of this fund um so once the fund is wound down you want to revoke your fund license and then you want to revoke being regulated so so many venture capitalists will say well actually no you know what fund cycle's gone but he may have set up another venture capital fund along the way or several venture capitalist funds along the way but but you know, he may say, well, I want to start up a new one. I've done this one now and, you know, I'm going to start a new one. So then they have to decide, well, you know, do they want to revoke the license, which is basically voluntary going to the regulator and saying, look, I don't need the license anymore because I've made a huge amount of money and I'm now going to retire um, yeah. and and I'm done. And, or or yeah, probably start another fund. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> Mainly venture capitalists, they're, they're not people to sit back and rest on their laurels, you know. Not many people just walk off to the sunset so they're very motivated by this area. They find it fascinating and, and they want to continue. Um, but, you know, so you, you, you basically want all your regulatory requirements. You want the auditor to come in and sign everything off and your books of records for your company. You want to wind your company down in an orderly fashion. You want to make sure that the regulators can still access books and records as the, as the and regulatory for how long that would be? Uh, is it? Does it that access to the documents go beyond? The closing down yeah i mean it, it, yeah do you know what i mean you could wind up your company and, and the regulator could come to you and say look yeah this i still need these 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 kyc records that you had 10 years ago and and as i say if you've got a six year after the business relationship has ended you know and the, and the fund is, is wound up you've still got a requirement to um to to provide those records did you um, say six it, years on that or uh, is there some yeah, I said six years six years after the business restart relationship and so if you had a fund investor that you've redeemed out because you're winding the fund out you know you've still got a responsibility to maintain and hold those records in place the regulator or indeed the police or indeed any enforcement agency wants to come and request them and and that's important you know so your regulatory requirements continue you know not in such a heavy sense of when you were regulated but you still have a responsibility to the regulator uh and to, to hold on to these records and you know what things can get very messy if you do not have the orderly wind down of a company and of a fund and of a, a regulatory status you know it's it's a real shame it, especially if it's been a local fund and so I actually say it's, it's your own personal liability here. So if you're a venture yeah, capital manager, you know, you don't want someone saying, look, you should, you know, a year after you haven't filed company accounts because you haven't, you know, run a company up properly. You know, the regulator still wants the records and you can't produce them. You know, take it seriously, wind down properly. Again, thank you so much, Brian. I really appreciate you taking time for us. I've really, I've really enjoyed it. I've really enjoyed it. And yes, let's please collaborate on other ones. Yeah, it's been good.